OK, so relational ecology and design. And I've learned in this year of Zoom fatigue and the exhaustion that we all feel by listening to people like me talking too much to give you the takeaways at the top of my talk rather than at the end. And those are the following three propositions. Firstly, that this word sustainable design is about relationships and not just about transactions. It's about care and not just consumption. That's proposition one. Number two, sustainable design means care for all of life, life worlds, not just human life. I'm going to explain what that means, but it's a big shift from the focus we've all had in the last basically decade. And then thirdly, um, as I will go through the next 40 minutes, we need better relationships between places, communities and nature. These relationships can be enabled by social infrastructure and that creating this infrastructure is for me the big design opportunity. And I'm hoping that in the question time, that's what we can look at is something actually to do in our different uh, contexts. But I'll start um, with a theory of change because Claudio said how difficult it was to describe what I do. And I have the same, I share his difficulty. I've done many different things. I'm sure many of you have as well. But this slide and these words basically explain my relationship to change, how I think change is happening, how I think change always happens, and in particular, what my role in that bigger picture is. And as I guess some of you will know, Ilya Prigogine was one of the founders of systems thinking. And uh, he's a physicist and not a, not a designer, but he basically said, when looking at systems in lots of different contexts, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system. And I think we can probably all agree that the system, the systems around us are far from equilibrium, chaotic in many different ways. And that therefore, rather than try and come up with a blueprint to change everything from the top, I believe that the bigger opportunities to change things for all of us is to look for small islands of coherence, wherever they may be and whatever form they might take, and figure out ways to either help the islands do better on their own or help the islands connect with each other. And so insofar as I can explain all the diverse activities that I've done. This is my last book, which is the only commercial slide in my presentation. Um, the book is based on the previous five years of collecting stories and travels around the world of examples of how people are meeting daily life needs in ways that are very different from the kind of mainstream. And I've traveled to all over the world until this year and I've stopped completely. But the book and my work generally is me drawing your attention to somebody in a, India uh, with a form of bicycle commerce or somebody caring for elderly people in Ecuador or individual small examples that have the germs within them, their seed, a small plant of how I think the rest of us could learn for the bigger picture. So three parts of what I'll then, the main part of my talk, I'll explain what this word relational design means. It's a kind of four slides, not too much theory. Then I'm going to talk about four examples of life worlds, which is to say, is my word these days, instead of the word sustainability, which I find too abstract, too heavy, and nobody really is excited by the word sustainability. I think the word life worlds is much more dynamic for me, and I'll explain that, for example. And then part three is this notion of social infrastructure, what it is, and how you guys in your different worlds can contribute to its creation. So then, part one, relational design. Um, I told you at the beginning, this notion of my takeaway that value does not inhere in objects, it arises from relationships. This is a big restatement of what our focus can be. And rather than me give you a lecture that would be rather hard to absorb this early in the morning, 
there's a little booklet of 64 pages on the left, which you can download um, as a PDF, which for me is the most clearly explained. It's not by me, it's by a Canadian called David Mollier. What does this word of reimagining value mean? If we think about care more than products, the commons rather than um, enclosure, the relationship between cyberspace and nature, as you see there, I recommend it very much. You don't have to agree with it, but it gives you a, a sense of what this value discussion is all about. Our relationships with place is another relationship that can be refreshed and renewed. I'm guessing that many of you are Italians by background, and so Italy is one of the cultures of the world which doesn't need to be educated about the importance of territory, terroir, um, place. Um, it's um, where people like me go to learn about the different relationships that healthy societies have with their place. Even so, Italy, along with these children in Scotland, in this case, there is so much energy to be created by focusing on where we live, where we work, and where we commune with each other, rather than very abstract uh, notions of you know global technologies, global uh, algorithms, global tech, you know global relationships. Relationship with place gives a frame and a grounding that I think uh, we're all discovering in different ways has tremendous power. Um, and then another relationship that we need to restore and regrow is the relationship between the urban and the rural. I mean, I'm guessing that I've seen many of you working for big sort of consulting firms or tech companies or energy companies. Overwhelmingly, I imagine, have spent the years until now working in cities, meeting clients in cities, going to conferences about the future of the city, uh, designing apps for the city, all of which will no longer will not stop being relevant or very dynamic. But this is like just one part of the story of living on a single planet, namely the connection between the urban and the rural is where the health of our planet has been lost. We're disconnected with, with nature, with the land, with soil, with rivers, with the air. And then reconnecting uh, those two worlds, which are in fact one world, that is where the difference can be made. And of course, civic relationships are so important, so fractured by last uh, years in many different cultures. We're getting back to um, the notion of embodied physical meeting is at a local scale, connecting with place and connecting with people. This, of course, is a pre-COVID picture. This one, I think, is from England, but all over the world, people are rediscovering the kind of joys and also the potential of small groups making decisions about their place. This has been disrupted tremendously by COVID, of course. And here I'm talking to you online. You do a lot of your work online. We just have to multiply by 10 our creative efforts to recapture the qualities of meeting in place. And relationship to materials. I don't know how many of you are involved in product development, but you know, design is origins of design are in making things, even if it's uh, expanded tremendously. And very often when I talk to people outside the design community, they say, oh, you designers are responsible for all the trouble. You design things we don't need. We use and waste materials, we create pollution, we create uh, damage by our activities, which is, of course, partly true. But also, I very passionately believe that designers, because they're very uh, connected to materiality, have uh, the capacity to ask new and different questions. The relationship to materials here of the fashion designers and fashion producers, they're asking, who made my clothes? Where were they made? How were they made and what condition was the soil after the fiber was grown to make my clothes? And from that kind of um, new set of questions, the materiality of our relationships uh, becomes possible to transform. This, by the way, is one of a network called Ravelry, which if you don't know, is eight million people around the world who are fascinated by wool and fiber and making and growing and is one of many more or less invisible networks, which I think are transforming the world underneath our attention. 
Okay, so that is, if you like, a kind of quick suggestion of what relational design is about. It's creating relationships that have been broken by modernity, broken by the kind of economy that we have now, but that are beginning to be repaired in lots of different ways. But part two of my talk, I called it Life World because I do appreciate in my own work, one deals with the necessity to help people in big organizations or for that matter in small ones, make rather radical shifts where the kind of infrastructure, the business models, the incentives, the education, all of those soft features make it very different to change. And the best example I've known is, as I said at the beginning, rather than talk too much in abstract terms, to show you examples of where this profound transformation is happening. So here are four short case studies, short stories about places where the focus of creativity, of innovation, of business success and of progress is on the living world rather than on the manufactured world or the digital world. It's a big, big change. And most of us, including me, have spent the last yeah, 20, 30 years promoting and riding the wave of digital. I think digital is kind of not done, but it's become an infrastructure that is no longer the kind of worthy of our obsession. The living world is where all the action is. Uh, but there is a big difference between how, for example, the United States and the kind of Silicon Valley model and the startup model treats it and Europe and Asia. And that's what I'll show you in these four stories, because for me, the focus has to be on innovation and developing uh, products and services that combine these three different kinds of value, social value, ecological value and um, uh, economic value. If those three are not, so to speak, present in any project that one is embarking on, then one will go in a wrong direction. That's my proposition. So what does this mean in practice? I don't know how many of you have been following the uh, sort of spectacular evolution so far of Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, somebody told me last week, oh, they are for sure the next Facebook. And I wish I had 10 euros for everybody who's told me about a company which will be the next Facebook. The reason that people are um, excited about Ginkgo Bioworks is that um, they're getting the rate of uh, investment from venture capitalists and other sorts of investors is similar in trajectory and amplitude as uh, it was with the early days of Facebook. They have this uh, fantastic skill with writing slogans, so they call themselves the organism company. Um, they talk about biology, biodesign. They say that biology is the factory of the future and that life is the new tech. They have a really somewhere and they've got writers and copywriters and uh, storytellers who are rather good at describing what they do as a profound break with everything there at the moment, which is a very brilliant um, approach to doing a startup where you need to get investors getting overexcited. The, the physicality of what they produce and the experiments that they do in their early stage prototyping is indeed a very uh, interesting, a fascinating fusion of digital frameworks and but you know, like living processes. And there are real potentials in the kind of uh, early stage prototyping they're doing for for example, plants or, um, you know, uh, biology, farming industrially in urban contexts and so on. The, the range of projects that they're involved with is tremendous. They've been very, very heavily involved in uh, COVID therapies and COVID vaccine aspects. Um, the point being that this is, it's exciting, but for me, Ginkgo Bioworks is the latest version of an existing story. That is to say, heavy capital investment, heavy um, collection of um, IP, intellectual property, heavy kind of uh, attention to disrupting markets and disrupting um, ecosystems in a good way. It has worked for 
the small number of companies that have become Facebooks in the digital world. That is their kind of explicit and stated uh, ambition to be the Facebook of, of biology, which I think is not unlikely to happen to a degree, but to me that is not where the future lies in terms of sustainability. And here I have to basically put into one slide what I think is the fundamental difference between a Silicon Valley view of the biological economy or the nature-based economy and a European or an Asian one, namely that if you see that uh, we're talking about life worlds, that is to say worlds containing different sorts of entities, different beings, life which is completely dependent for its success on the context and where the context is king, then from that perspective, care means embodied relational understanding. Now, I'll tell you a surprising thing about these words, which is I just learned them like uh, three weeks ago. These are not uh, writers from the world of tech or business um, or design. They're writers from the world of nursing, care for people in medical situations, care for people in social situations. So a Swedish and an English professor, and they're part of an ecosystem saying, how do we develop the practice of care? How do we train all the nurses in the world and the paramedics and the frontline medical staff to do their job more than just looking at the symptoms or not just looking for therapies or not just looking for tech? How do we nurse and care for the whole person? And the debate is beginning to emerge there that if we can transform what we think about care for people and caring for context and caring for place, the same principle applies, namely the place and the context and the ecology matter just as much as the uh, tech or the product. And this is where I compare um, Ginkgo Bioworks to a project here in France. I'm speaking to you from France today, uh, just a couple of hours from here. Um, a project called Luma Arles, and in particular, uh, a thing called Atelier Luma. So in the picture, you can see a, an art tower built, designed by Frank Geary, which will open some April of 2021 next year. Is a kind of very spectacular, but it, you know, basically it's an art gallery, but a very high end one, obviously. For me, the more interesting part of this project in France is called Atelier Luma, and it's a bioregional design lab, which is all about those words I was just using to say what Ginkgo Bioworks is not. That is to say, it's about place, it's about soil, it's about um, the region. And that the design task is to find ways of creating new value out of those things which are there. So you have people uh, mapping and researching all sorts of different dimensions of the place, which in this case is in a rather spectacular former railway building. You have historians looking at the history of the region. This is in the Camargue. Uh, which some of you may know in France, it's a very, it's just kind of very spectacular bioregion with unique qualities in many different ways. I won't go into the details, but the history is one of the tasks that they explicitly make as a value creating activity. They have groups looking at geology, at climate, and the relationship of geology and climate to the economy over hundreds of years. There's a group came from Harvard to do a kind of six month course just about the geology of that area and made this enormous atlas, that's my hand on it, with some extraordinary um, speculations and analysis about how the wind shaped agriculture, how the rocks shaped the salt culture, how the interaction of wind and climate enabled different sorts of agriculture, such as sunflower seeds or rice. Learning about the history enabled people to look to the future. They looked at how in the past um, agriculture and the use of land had evolved, um, for example, in the history of the rice business. They looked at how in the past and today people used naturally growing materials to create material to different sorts of fiber textiles. 
And they looked at the land itself in detail for plants, for living systems, for ecologies that might have potential. In other words, they did not, uh, this is an ongoing project, it's only been going for, I guess, three or four years. Um, Atelier Luma brings people from very diverse disciplines together and say, what are we looking at here? Where, what is the nature of this place? And what can we do in it and with it that has not been done until now? And so you can look on their website, there's a very, very well documented. Um, they make prototypes of materials, prototypes of processes and so on, on an ongoing basis. People do that all the time. I know you do that at, in Milan, of course you do. I'm just describing this as a kind of place-based example, very specifically. They look at materials that can be derived from agricultural wastes or from the landscape itself. And the most um, notable example, which some of you have maybe heard of, is called the algae platform, where over the last four years, different researchers and designers have been looking at how they can take algae, which grow naturally in the region, and make different sorts of products from them. And you end up with a recognizable thing, a container, a vessel. Mankind has had vessels for hundreds of thousands of years. Here we are I'll back at the Atelier Luma, where all this different research leads to prototyping, which is a subject you know, prototyping with materials, prototyping with wastes, and so on. And the best known of their kind of uh, initiatives is called the Algae Platform, where they've spent the last four years experimenting with ways to create different sorts of products out of naturally found algae in the Camargue bioregion. And one of the outcomes are prototypes for vessels of the kinds that can begin to replace the packaging that all over the world is a major source of difficulty for food and beverage and hospitality industries. And the proposition we ended up with, I'm not part of this, I'm a friend of their, their project, but I'm not involved, is could every region in the world have something like an algae lab to develop basically everyday life utensils um, out of the naturally growing materials of that region? So, interesting question. And for anybody who's interested, they have a thing called an algae summit um, happening in two weeks' time, which is on the Atelier Luma website. So, here's another example. Urban life world. So, I mentioned, if you remember at the beginning, that it's important for all of us to find ways to reconnect what's happening in cities with what's happening outside cities. And this is um, featuring very much in discussions around the world on notions of green infrastructure or green new deals. So this is um, every country, I suspect, you know, somebody I saw, 163 countries have some sort of green new deal discussion happening to, to get out of COVID. One of the branches of that discussion looks at nature in the city as a form of infrastructure that can be built or retrofitted, which is a vast opportunity, uh, lots of argument about what the words mean. Um, in, I've been doing quite a lot of work in Shanghai in the last year until this year, obviously, where the notion of green infrastructure is very much explicitly an alternative to the concrete kind of infrastructure, which China has become so uh, remarkable at doing, and they want infrastructure that can be grown rather than poured as concrete. Uh, in all, this is in, I think this is in, in Norway, every country has lists of aspects of a city that can be greened in different ways, planted, restored, depaved, or whatever. You don't need to read that list of words, just see it as one of many examples. Nature in the city uh, also takes the form of gardens that can be uh, retrofitted place by place and then connected together. Uh, this is one in Lyon. Um, there are thousands of these projects now um, in different parts of Europe and in the United States. Or you can have notions of intervening in the city on micro scales, pollinator corridors. 
Um, this is from Seattle. And here is uh, one, for, I'm getting strange sounds, but I'll just keep on talking, hope for the best. Um, and then the uh, recent phenomenon of microbial interventions in the city. Once people have discovered that microbes are a source of vitality and potentially of value, all over the place people are saying, how many microbial uh, communities do we have in our city nearby? And there's a French scientist called Elizabeth Enaf, a microbial forager. I'm diverting a bit, but I want to just show you about the extraordinary variety of innovation and creative activities when life in the city itself becomes the focus. And I think that the opportunity at a systems level and infrastructure level is to evolve from trying to hide nature, try to hide living things, trying to hide microbes, making them more visibly part of the urban uh, landscape itself, and the presence of compost heaps with um, high levels of maintenance and skill used for the compost is one of the interesting phenomena. So from this is, I think, in Boston, the notion of having compost heaps with Internet of Things sensors to monitor uh, the, the temperature of the heap and help people uh, keep an eye on the, the health of their compost in much the same way that smart city people monitor traffic. The next thing in a natural city will be monitoring the health of the city's compost heaps. Now, this is just by way of saying there's a lot happening in this notion of civic ecology. This is just a, some of the organizations and books and platforms. For those of you interested, um, there's an interesting conference in February of next year called The Nature of Cities. If you look at the bottom where the red arrow is, they're doing a five day kind of round the world review of the most interesting uh, interventions in cities to bring nature and the city back together again. That's up, but I'll, I'll tell you about my favorite subject and then I may have to shorten the conclusion. But I don't think we should have a presentation about design and relational design without talking about food and restaurants. This, of course, has been one of those parts of the world utterly upended by COVID. And if you remember, I said at the beginning that my work as a writer and a collector of stories, I should say two thirds of the time, if I'm traveling around, I'm on my way to or from a meal. Um, and in that picture on the top right is a bowl of noodle soup, which I located in Shanghai last November before COVID got going. But as an example of what I think is a transformation of the relationship between people and food, which has been accelerated very dramatically by COVID, but was already emerging. The notion of local food, firstly, the notion of direct relationships between city people and the food that um, the farmers who grow their food. So I found that soup, to cut a long story short, through an app which this woman uh, runs. She's a, called a key opinion leader on street food. She travels around mainly Shanghai and other areas, finding amazing street food in this very unprepossessing back alley, puts it on her channel. And people like me then rush around to see what it's like. And I have to say, it is quite amazing. I've been looking for street food all my life. So part of the market. But in terms of design thinking and sustainability, which I haven't forgotten that these are our words, the important point about this disruption is that it allows us to reconnect, to recreate relationships between place and food and person and tool and skill in completely new ways, because we have to, but also because we can. And this is um, a Thai designer called Nubap, wonderful guy working with me and some friends in the south of Italy, in the Basilicata, which some of you will know, where the project that we've been exploring for the last yeah, five or six years is different ways of connecting together 
creating relationships between the assets of a small town, in this case Grottoli, and people from outside who might want to come and eat or study or learn or whatever. And the relational design aspect is two phases. One is identifying assets in the village, people, places, traditions, knowledge, skills, and then combining those in such a way that somebody can come as a visitor and connect with them and have a meal, learn a skill or whatever. Now, of course, during COVID in the food world, especially this has all been uh, completely uh, radically accelerated. But the design opportunity here is that although there is a rather dynamic uh, Europe wide network of people doing the back end of, so to speak, peer to peer restaurants or shops directly selling from the farm to the table. And this is open food net is one of the more uh, beautiful examples of that. The front end side of it remains basically to be developed. It's very undeveloped and there's a vast amount of work to be done in reconfiguring the way that food moves in and around cities. As some of you will know, I'm rather obsessed by cargo bikes and I'm more than a little obsessed by cargo bikes and food trucks. But if you can imagine that everything to do with food and distribution and eating and being present can be is up for grabs. Yeah, it's extraordinary what the potential can be. And I just come back to the Chinese situation because to me, the one of the biggest revolutions that's happening is the possibility for farmers to talk directly to people in the city. Which sounds obvious, but I'm all oh, I've been working for 25 years on food related subjects and always we say if only the farmer could talk directly to the person who eats her food, so much would change. But that's what's now happening with the, uh, the Taobao platform in China. So at the moment, there are 50,000 farmers in one way or another doing live streaming with people in the city. Their project, um, their target for the end of this year is 250,000, and this is China, so I'm sure they'll reach that. There's, a, there's all sorts of fantastic stories. This is a chicken farmer who's become a celebrity on the kind of online space by making videos about his chickens. Tens, hundreds of thousands of followers he has. But then the crucial thing, and this is where the notion of social infrastructure comes in, is that you cannot just set up a platform and expect farmers to suddenly become experts at live streaming. You need a system for training the farmers, for getting them organized, to give them tools, to give them a bit of training. And that's what Taobao do. Taobao, as you presumably may know, is part of Alibaba, that they have created a so-called Taobao University which contains teachers who are completely nomadic and mobile. They go out into the farm. There are 230 million small farmers in China, so they have a lot of work to do. But they go out, they get them started, and then each of those guys on the right started out um, as a farmer, and now they're an online farmer. And the opportunity here is that every life world, and by life world I mean a space or a, a, a city or a region, needs its own Taobao University. Now, I've done my 40 minutes with a couple of breaks, so I'm just going to spend two minutes eating into the question time to run through past three, because I did promise at the beginning to talk about this concept of social infrastructure, which is uh, defined in this way. It's the organizational tools and models that enable people to do good work by Donatella Della Arata, who, if you don't know, you should find out about her work on what social infrastructure means and how might you like to define it. And another way of thinking about it is that it's non-market forms of social coordination, which I took from that little booklet at the beginning by David Wallier. Both of these things probably look difficult for you to make a business out of. It's true, compared to making a large and expensive platform, it's difficult. But I decided to summarize all the possibilities in one concept, which is, I think, where I'm going to 
stop so we can have our discussion. So in the last years, as you all know, in different ways, have been chief information officers, chief operating officers, big commercial organizations started to have chief design officers um, in various ways. People from time to time, I saw one or two of you in the attendance list uh, have some title like sustainability officer of some kind. These are coherent, OK examples of the story so far. But if you buy into my proposal that basically things are now changing much more profoundly, then we need some way of coordinating all these different activities, either in a city or in a big organization. And so I'm proposing, and I just invented this this morning, a new job title for some of you called Chief Nature Officer. And your job would be to bring uh, the operations of your organization into alignment with the notion of driving ecosystems that I described in various ways in my talk. So I'm hoping that this is a kind of a way to end my uh, formal remarks because I know that you want to know, OK, what am I supposed to do with this information? My single uh, simplest sort of suggestion is that you go and write yourself a job description called Chief Nature Officer and go and find somebody uh, who will give you a job with that title. Um, yeah, these are the things I was going to talk about, which I won't. But now I will um, end uh, without stealing too much more of your time. And uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next phase. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for the inspiring talk. Uh, and uh, independently from uh, the small technical issue that we, we had, uh, I think that you cover all the topic that you promised at the beginning. So thank you very much for inspiring us. Uh, in the meantime, we have already collected almost, uh, let me count, but around 20 questions that obviously we will not be able to uh, completely serve through them. But likely enough, it seems that uh, two out of the 20 uh, uh, pop up, uh, at least as the ones that receive also the uh, uh, I guess votes uh, from uh, the audience. So uh, if you don't mind, I will start from uh, the two questions uh, that got uh, the, the great portion of the votes, uh, and hopefully they will be interested also for uh, the, the other ones. And uh, I would say that it's quite straightforward. You partially talk also about COVID. There is a lot of questions about, uh, let's say, how COVID is uh, 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 affecting uh, uh, the topic that you mentioned. And the first question is exactly in this vein. Do, do you think that COVID is affecting the relational ecology that you were talking about? And eventually, let me add, how you think that COVID will change the relational ecology that you, you talk about during the seminar? Uh, yeah, the simple answer is yes, of course. Um, I made a promise to myself when it became clear in January, February time that the world was changing completely. And along with everybody else, I said, I'm not going to kind of leap into print or start writing text about what it all means. I gave myself this year to just see what happens, to, to let reality kind of do its thing. And we're still in the middle of November or towards the end of November. So I don't have a conclusion about exactly what I think the COVID means for all of our lives and work, except to say that I think that the, the disruptions that we've seen, I mentioned the food system, hospitality, aviation, tourism, offices, work. Uh, these are for me, changes that have been amplified and accelerated by COVID, but they didn't come out of nowhere. And COVID didn't create these sort of changes just because of itself, because of the illness. I think what COVID did is to reveal structural weaknesses and bad ways of organizing things that are not going to return simply because uh, I, we can't or it's not necessary. So just a good example, my sister who lives in London, spent 30 years as a, in a publishing, traveling in and out of London every day for two hours each way uh, on a badly crowded train in order to sit in an office in the center of London uh, doing her work as a book publisher. 
uh, with 120 other people in a rather crowded room. And they would all go out every lunchtime and have uh, sandwiches or maybe a glass of wine. Um, and her, so she was spending of her life, um, yeah, four hours a day in travel and something like 30% of her gross income on traveling costs, including the costs of the sandwiches that she would eat every lunchtime and so on. That stopped for her and for millions of other people. And it's very clear to me that that simply is not going to return. So you're not going to get those millions of people going back into a lifestyle where they sort of you spent four hours a day in unpleasant travel, huge percentage of their income on um, uh, yeah, the traveling unpleasantly to get to spend your day in a very crowded, uncomfortable office dealing with people that you didn't communicate with clearly. So, of course, everything is changing. But I think that what was happening before is that we lived in a world which was too expensive. Why would, uh, I mean, I, I haven't lived in England, I'm a Brit, and, but I haven't lived there for 30 years. But every time I go there, I say, why anybody sane will spend six pounds on a glass of beer or four pounds on a sandwich? Why? What is the point? And I think that for many years, I was thought from the countryside for asking such questions. Now, millions of people all over the world are having the same ex experience of, why well, would I go back to that? So just very basic stuff, going to work, having a job, eating a sandwich, all that's changed completely. That's not going to come back. What is not so clear is, and I absolutely hope I haven't given the impression that I know, because I don't, what will replace it? But what I think will replace it is the, the elements of these stories that I've shared with you today. That is to say, if I show you somebody selling sandwiches from a bicycle in Zurich, which I've just won slides, the notion of selling a sandwich from a bicycle is so profoundly different from opening a restaurant in an expensive building with lots of marketing and branding and expensive tables and furniture and glasses. Those two worlds are, you know, light and day. But the notion of how you then recreate the experience of eating food in the city, there's 101 possibilities. That's, that's what I think is exciting about this present moment. I'll stop there for the moment. Yeah, th th thanks, John, uh, also for this answer. And uh, let me try to surf also through the second one that is not specifically about COVID, but I found it particularly interesting. Uh, the question is about spaces. And more specifically, uh, uh, assuming that we will uh, leave more and more both physical and digital spaces, and sometimes uh, we will live in a sort of digital context. Uh, uh, the question is about the implication that this digital context could have on our relationships, again, on, on the relational ecology that you were talking about, how we can rely on this, let's say, hybridization uh, uh, among spaces in order to nurture our relationships? Well, this is a brilliant question, which I have been asking myself for 26 years. I know that <laughs> sounds crazy, but it was in 1993, we organized a conference in Amsterdam, which is the first big internet conference in Europe, about the subject of virtual reality and the internet. And we had all sorts of technical people showing us amazing examples of teleconferencing, virtual reality environments. And everybody said at the time, everything has changed. We will live online from this moment onwards. And that was, as I said, in 1993. And half of you probably weren't even born in 1993. I am very disappointed, to put it mildly, that in all those years, the experience of connecting online has not really improved very much at all. Um, you know, I think Zoom is good, Teams is okay for certain little technical details, but if you remember <laughs> that slide I showed you about embodied relational understanding, I understand, I learned back in the 1990s that unless our experiences are embodied, our bodies are as important as our brains and our eyes, then the quality of our relationships will never be the same. That hasn't been COVID. It just means that we've got to try 10 times harder to recreate the embodied side of things and not just uh, you know, improve the functionality of Zoom or, or Teams. I don't 
I don't know how we're going to, we can't solve this completely. And I think many people are saying, as you say, it's a brilliant word, hybrid, physical and, uh, you know, digital. We probably need to be more mindful and design minded in having less time online and more time in our bodies in nature. That can be organized. It's not so difficult. Um, the other thing I would say is in terms of you're in a communication company or if you have an offices company or you have a you know, an internet web company or your interaction designer, figuring out how to get people like artists or theatre people or writers or poets, they are much better than most tech people and most designers at rethinking these questions. So I'm very much, in my own work, I get far more inspiration from poets and from theatre people at this moment about hybrid relationships than I do from the tech world. So. Um, I think I, I warmly commend that you look outside the box, Ron.